Hi, I'm Greg Lobbs, the Civilization V Community Manager here at 2K Games, bringing you an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at the making of Civilization V. With over 9 million units sold worldwide, resounding critical acclaim, and multiple awards to its name, Civilization is recognized as one of the greatest strategy franchises of all time. To bring this series into its fifth offering takes the diverse skills of the talented people at Firaxis Games. During this video, we'll explore the history of the Civilization franchise, get a closer look at the team that created the fifth iteration in this revolutionary series, and learn more about what brought Civilization V to life. Civilization was originally created at Microprose in the late uh, 1980s. Uh, the idea was actually inspired by a couple things. Uh, a lot of us were playing SimCity at the time, and we kind of really enjoyed that idea of building something instead of blowing something up. That was kind of a new idea. Uh, you'd actually create something of your own design, and that was a, a, attractive. We'd actually done a game uh, just a little bit before that called Railroad Tycoon, which had a few of the elements of civilization. There was building, there was kind of a combination of various systems, economic, uh, competition, all those kind of things. And uh, we kind of liked the way that game felt. It had a kind of God aspect to it. It was creative, it was building. But we said, you know, what's a bigger topic that we could approach, you know, with these kind of ideas? And uh, civilization kind of came to us. You know, what if you were conquering the entire world, building a civilization to stand the test of time? And all these cool things we could include, uh, technology, history, uh, military conquest, politics, culture, diplomacy. Uh, it just seemed like a very rich topic to, to approach with this idea of starting small, but then at, by the end of the game having gone through this kind of epic journey to uh, create a, a unique story of your own. So that was kind of the, the genesis of uh, the original civilization which came out in, in the late 80s. Um, really had no idea whether it was going to be a success or a failure or, you know, were we kind of on the wrong track. And it actually took a couple months before we started to get some really good feedback from our, from our uh, players. In those days there was no internet, so actual letters written on paper came to us. Uh, and people said, you know, hey, you know, I like this game, it was fun, it's new, it's, uh, I can't stop playing. That was the, the new thing for us. We started hearing about all these stories about players that couldn't stop, had to play one more turn, and that was really an indication that we were kind of on to something with this, uh, this style of game and this approach. Um, Civilization II, which came out next, uh, was actually designed uh, by, by Brian Reynolds. He uh, went off to England for a year. His, his wife had an opportunity to, uh, to teach there, he, and he came back essentially with Civilization II. Um, and uh, there were a lot of really uh, kind of innovative new features there. I think that uh, the, the modding is the one that we, we all remember, the ability to kind of create your own scenarios and change the game. And that really uh, gave Civilization II a, a, a very long life uh, cycle because it was constantly being refreshed by the, the community. And um, I, we learned another lesson there, the, the whole idea of how if we could, every, every Civilization player is kind of a, a wannabe designer in a lot of ways. And a lot of our letters reflected that. You know, it was like, hey, Sid, Sid, I liked your game, Civilization, but here are the five things I would change about it. Uh, so for some reason, Civilization kind of brought out the inner designer in, in most of our players. So modding really allowed players to, to, to experiment with that and, 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 and do that. Uh, Civilization III uh, came out uh, after we had formed Paraxis and a lot of wild and crazy things that happened with the Civilization franchise um, and uh, called a power had come out. It was, for a while, we, uh, we actually never thought we'd do another Civilization game, and then the stars aligned, and we were given the opportunity to do Civilization III. And that was a, that was a fun uh, thing to kind of come back to that after, uh, after we'd been away for a while. Uh, with all the uh, versions, we try and do some new things, add uh, new features, but keep the core intact. And that's always a, a balancing act uh, that, that we kind of spend a lot of time discussing, really involve the community in that discussion. Um, with Civ 3, for the first time, we uh, had the internet uh, to kind of uh, put us in touch with players. Uh, we got a lot of ideas from them, and we actually established a, a beta testing group that helped us uh, with a lot of our, testing a lot of our ideas. So uh, much more of a community-oriented game. Uh, Civilization 4, we turned Soren Johnson loose on Civilization, and, and he kind of gave his take on it. Um, some of the emphases there were a multiplayer, kind of for the first time we really focused on that from the beginning of the, of the game. 
Uh, with Civ 5, we're building on a lot of those ideas and adding uh, a lot of new ideas. Uh, uh, John Schaefer, who's leading that design, kind of threw away a lot of the old paradigms and put in a lot of his own. And so it's kind of an opportunity to try a lot of new things and, 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 and come up with a, a fresh take on civilization. I was just another player of the game not too long ago. Uh, just like everybody else, I bought the Civ games and played them and said, oh, this sucks, I wish I could change this. And then, uh, you know, by, uh, by uh, luck or fate or what have you, uh, I had the opportunity to actually go and, and take the reins and do a lot of things that I wanted to do. And it's, it's been really exciting. It's been uh, very challenging, but um, very rewarding as well. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. Another major change in Civilization V is a switch from large stacks of units to only allowing one unit per tile. Very early on, we wanted, there were some changes made to the gameplay uh, that we were excited about. We wanted to make it a hex-based game, and we were going to limit it to one unit per tile. <clears throat> and the goal for that was, in previous Civ titles, the only square that really mattered was where your city was. And a lot of gameplay would be dictated on where each city was. And we were trying to make every, every tile very important. Once we switched to hexes, we realized <clears throat> everything could change visually. Uh, we could have a much more organic world. So hexes do a few different things for us that, we, that we're really happy about. Um, first off, they help us in the gameplay side. Uh, what that means is there are no diagonals on the corners, which means that uh, there's no advantages in terms of movement and visibility. Uh, anybody who's played a lot of Civ knows that that's kind of the best way to play the game, and it's, it's constantly ingrained in the way that you approach it. So we wanted to remove that bias and kind of e make every move uh, equal in a way. Uh, additionally, it helps us on the graphics side as well. Uh, because there are no corners, um, 90 degree angles aren't very nice to look at, so uh, we can make the maps look a lot more organic and uh, free-flowing, and uh, it just it, it improves the look and feel of the game as well. So the hexes do a couple really big things for us. We went for a really realistic style for Civ Five with the units. Both Mike and I appreciate more realistic type of games and realistic type of art. Uh, our lead artist, Dorian Newcomb, said we wanted a classical type approach to this game. So we went for more realistic, historically inspired assets. Uh, Mike designed a lot of the modern units down here, and I did more of the ancient, medieval, and uh, industrial units. We use color to make the units distinct through the types of metal and the kind of armor they use. For instance, the spearmen would use a, a bronze color to indicate the kind of armor that they used and the kind of weapons they had, where uh, the later units, the, the knight, has the strong steel, uh, stronger colors. And then each unit will have team color based on whatever civilization you have. Well, every time we get a unit to do, we, we go into uh, research mode and we just go through everything that we have, internet, everything else we have, and we just try to pick the more archetypal version of whatever we're in, whether it's the pikeman or uh, the modern tank or something like that. We, we do a lot of research because people will look at that and a lot of people will know if it's accurate or not. So. A unit that I really loved that came out great was the battleship. We redesigned the battleship for this game after the USS Iowa. It was a battleship and we saw one of them in New Jersey, not too far away, the USS New Jersey is on display and it's an Iowa class battleship. Trying to get that many guns packed into a small little unit was a great challenge and Jason Guy did a great job. Uh, Mike helped with the concept for that at all. Something interesting, because the ship is so long, we modeled it at real scale, but once we saw it in the game, we realized it was too big for a hex. So we actually had to squish it down 80%. So it's a little squat, but it still looks really good in the game. Probably the most interesting thing I did was actually do the mech, which appears at the end of the game. It's probably the, it's the ultimate LAN unit that you can get. It's more powerful than anything on the land, and that That's was awesome. fun design. Uh, the first Civilization game to have a mech was Beyond the Sword, and that's when we first introduced that. So I think we wanted to include this one in the game this time. So uh, basically after building all the tank units and that sort of thing that are in the game, all the armor units, um, I was tasked out with doing the mech. So that, that was really like a nice little piece to do. So. Um, Basically, the concept is basically a walking tank. And we didn't want it to be uh, uh, really deviate from looking like a tank. We didn't want this like uh, Japanimation kind of round thing in there. We wanted something that was blocky and looked like a tank. And also had uh, more weapons than anything on the ground, too. We wanted it to look like it had a full arsenal. So 
Well, I think it's cool about the mech is that we that Mike really drew from real world inspiration, and anything drawn from the real world, the player can relate to more readily. Um, this cannon on top, where you, it, it's really inspired by the 30 Mike Mike gun on the Apache gunship, but in for our uses, it's a rail gun for our game, and you'll see it in the game, and it's awesome. It destroys everything else, and we also have this bank of Hellfire missiles here. We have we have smoke launchers. We have uh, different kinds of sensors and eyepieces that people can look at and relate to. There is some hydraulics and heavy metal features that make this thing feel realistic and really believable. I think Mike did a great job designing Thanks, something man. that looks believable. One big challenge for the artists was creating the realistic leaders that the player would interact with throughout the game. Uh, when we started looking at uh, the experience of single player, uh, a single player playing the game Civ and they'd meet a leader, we knew that we wanted that to be an exciting experience. Uh, meeting Ramses uh, should feel awesome and you should feel like you went back to ancient Egypt. And because we were looking at historical fiction and looking at a lot of films, a lot of times there are great uh, throne room scenes where you're in the presence of that leader and it feels exotic and, and foreign and rich. And uh, so we had our concept artists do what we would call, you know, gunslinger shots, you know, from the mid thigh up of meeting these people and being in the presence of their throne. We played around a lot with populating them with people. Uh, we, we were going to have Caesar in a uh, Senate filled with people walking around. And as, we, as the budget started to come in, I, we realized maybe having hundreds of people in these scenes uh, wouldn't add a lot and would take away from that, uh, that leader uh, confronting you. And uh, then we decided to uh, have them speak in their language so that when, it, when you did meet with Caesar, he'd be in his Senate and he'd be speaking Latin. We would provide a translation so you could actually communicate with them. But we thought that would be cool. You know, that's the whole point of playing civilization is to experience um, history. And what better way than to meet people from lost civilizations and languages that aren't spoken anymore? Um, it, well, in Civ IV, uh, they didn't speak at all. Um, and we did have a, sort of a, 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 a Sim-style uh, voices in Civ Rev. Um, um, for Civ V, uh, we just figured that that, uh, that real language would set the tone a little more you know, it would fit in with the game a little more. And it's something I've always wanted to see. I think it's really cool. Um, you really get, it, it, it further gives you that sense of the culture. Just like I think the, more, the broader range of music in Civ V, also the speech, I think just adds to that, you know, sense of culture, you know. We have a, a, a studio that we work with in Montreal, a fabulous uh, wave generation that, for Civ IV, they, they recorded all the languages for uh, the units, when you selected them, they just, they, you know, they, they would say like, what will it be, you know, in their language. So we knew we had this resource that could find any language we could come up with. So we went to them and, um, and uh, basically um, uh, they found actors for us and we directed them from here and, um, and it, it came out great. Most of the in-house music is the leader music and uh, most of that uh, was written by myself and Jeff. Um, um, uh, Ian's writing one, and uh, Roland Rizzo is also writing a piece, uh, one of the leaders. Um, and uh, basically, uh, we we decided that we would we would use existing themes to base these pieces on. Um, and Jeff, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, usually, our first step is just searching for something, finding uh, an actual melody from the culture that, that we're doing the leader music for, and hoping that that melody is famous enough in that culture that if someone from that country uh, heard it, they would, they would instantly think, oh yeah, this is my country, and there'd be that sense of national pride. Um, some of the countries, we just had to find fragments, like ancient Rome. Uh, I think Michael just found these very, very old fragments of melodies, right. piece together a piece from that. Um, so we kind of find the source material and then combine it with the Western orchestra, and um, it ends up being this combination of Western influenced with different cultures. And actually there's a final step for a lot of the music. Um, we're actually gonna be recording it in Prague, which is really cool, so. We've written probably over three hours of original music for leaders in this game. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about an hour and 45 minutes worth of music is actually gonna be recorded uh, live with an orchestra. 
and, uh, and a few pieces with choir. Civilization V is the first game in the series to use Steamworks. Among other things, this has allowed the developers to make the multiplayer experience better than ever before. In, in terms of multiplayer, something that I think people will find really exciting is our use of Steam, and this is something that's new. Um, previous uh, Civ games have come out on Steam, but they haven't been integrated with, with Steam like Civ V is. It uses it for matchmaking, for friends, for achievements. There's just um, it's all centralized, it's, it's all solid, it's, it's gonna be a really good thing for the multiplayer community. Multiplayer's always been important to Civilization V. I, I mean, there's just a huge audience out there of people playing constantly, especially in Civilization IV. Uh, there's entire communities built around having tournaments, uh, even, what is it now, four or five years since the release of the last yeah, one? Yeah, five. It's huge, and, and they have these sites that have modded the game in such a way that all the reporting comes straight into the websites. Uh, it's, just, it's just ongoing, so extremely important. Modding has been a part of the Civilization series since Civilization II. For Civ V, the team was dedicated in making it the most moddable Civ game ever. Modding is, is definitely a huge part of Civ, um, especially with Civ IV. Um, that team did a really excellent job with the features. And uh, the priority with, with Civ IV was to make as much as possible moddable. We wanted to build on that and keep the power, but also to allow uh, more casual modders who aren't as hardcore into that modding scene to go and make changes as well. So one particular component that we're really excited about is the new World Builder. It's a standalone application that is very easy to use. You can fire it up. Um, you can add and remove things very, very, very quickly. Um, the whole program is super speedy. You can undo and redo things. It's just very easy to use, and it's something that, personally, I was really excited when I saw how it was coming along. And more than any other version of Civ, we're focusing on making this the most powerful, elegant, and easy to use tool we possibly can. Uh, so I personally have spent uh, quite a bit of time working on the interface, you know, making sure that it's easy to get into, making sure it's powerful, and most importantly, making sure it's flexible. The world builder will respond to your mod. It will know what items you have in your mod and will allow you to uh, determine what extra information you want, might want to save out with your file. So your maps are as customizable as the game itself. 
One of the other tools we have is a, a tool called ModBuddy. And uh, it's basically the tool that brings all of the mod files together. It's the interaction between the user and the community hub. It's a way for them to figure out how they're going to set up their scenarios, how they're going to define the gameplay roles, and how they're going to organize all of their map files that they built using the other tools. Um, it's also their direct link to uploading to the, uh, the in-game community hub. The Civ community has been pretty much vital to the development of this Civ and previous Civs. They are the driving force behind Civ, I would say. Civ 5 to me is, um, is really uh, an acknowledgement of the, the Civ community. It's something that, that uh, people have been asking for, have been you know, kind of waiting when is this coming out. I think it, it really is a reflection of how strong the community is out there, how many ideas they've generated, how they've kind of inspired us to be creative and try new things with, with civilization. So it's really uh, the fact that there's this very um, active, dynamic, uh, and, and, and interactive community out there that kind of inspires us to do new versions of civilization because you know, they, they've given us a, a lot of great feedback, uh, a lot of love on Civ 4. Uh, but now they're kind of ready for, uh, for the next iteration, and, and, and that's what Civ 5 represents. <laughs>